Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, last time I went over by about 25 minutes. No big deal, but I set a timer today. Okay, well, thank you for being here. I kind of concur with everything Wendy said. We're so excited that the community is coming out supporting our local history, our placentia history, our Orange County history, and our state history. And we're really excited um, for what we've done as a team, the historical committee, and for you guys as well as an audience. You guys have really come out to every single event we had and you surprise us every time and you tell your friends and the next time we see some of the same faces and some new faces. So I'm really, really grateful. Tonight we're gonna to talk a little bit about Orange County Ranchos. And as we do, I wanna put a couple disclaimers out there. It is gonna be fun. It is gonna be um, entertaining. It's going to be uh, informational. But there's also a lot of truth that's gonna come up. Just stuff you may know already because some of your relatives, stuff you don't know. But there's also a lot of myth. There's myth about Placentia, there's a myth about Orange County, there's a myth about California, and those myths uh, you know, turn into legend, and pretty soon the legend and the myth are told so often, they become truth. So I'm gonna tr introduce to you, if, in case you don't know, two or three or four myths that people perpetuate. I used to think that too. As well as some new myths you might not have heard of, but these myths all kind of came together with the truth about Placentia, the truth about Orange County, and the truth about California in general, in the Western United States, and in really, really, I think, fun and creative way, in a way that really makes you think, wow, you know, ideas, legends can really drive a people and drive a nation. Yeah, yeah, they can. And, and California is no, no different, and Orange County is certainly no different. So uh, let's get started. Let me see if I can figure out my pointer. Awesome. Okay, so that's what I just said. There we go. Let's get started. Okay, tonight's goal, if it's possible. If time allows, we're gonna to try to get through as much information as we can, but really I have two big goals. One is to tell you a little bit about California life, Spanish life, Mexican life, and a little bit of Native American culture, and kind of explain to you um, a little bit about how they live, because where we, where we are now, where we were then, was very isolated, and community was really, really important since there were so few people here. So a lot of what you're gonna learn about is just a little bit of how the, the people live, in particular a group of people called Californios, or Californios, or people today would just say local Orange County people. But there really is a, um, like a vaquero culture, uh, an old school California culture that developed uniquely in California for a lot of reasons that have to do with the truth, the, the mythology, the legend, and the geography. If there's time, and I hope there is, we're gonna to try to highlight at least two or three of the ranchos. Uh, there are at least 15 ranchos in Orange County that kind of touch somehow or in Orange County. And uh, we're gonna to try to hit Rancho Santiago de Santa Ana, 1810, Rancho Cañon de Santa Ana, 1834, and Placentia's Rancho San Juan Cajon de Santa Ana, and, and tell you a little bit about each, but, but not a lot, because uh, you know, we got a lot to do. So here we go, let's start with this. This is a beautiful map of California. A very, very inaccurate map of California. But this is where one of the first legends comes in. A long time ago, as the Europeans were leaving Europe and coming westward, and they were hearing all these stories of riches and gold, and some of them were true. There were definitely cities that had gold and definitely cities that had riches. And some cities were smaller and some were huge. But, but there's a little bit of truth to that. But a lot of it is just made up. And at a time when we couldn't verify information, and we didn't have Google, uh, you know, sometimes I forget to have Google on my phone and I get lost and I just start pushing buttons and I, I, I can find my car. My phone will just light up and show me where I am. Well, a long time ago, we didn't have that. So we had highly inaccurate maps and highly exaggerated maps. And I want to put out a couple things to you over here. This is New Mexico, Nueva España. It goes down this way into Central and South America and out this way to the Caribbean and back east. This is California, what we thought was California. What we accidentally discovered and it got reported, but nobody cared, is that it was, a, it was a, a peninsula, a big arm of Baja California connected up to Alta California. But the guy who found it tried to tell everyone there, there's no strait there, there's no island there, but the myth kind of started and it just kept perpetuating and perpetuating and perpetuating. And as uh, Europeans came westward, they would encounter some truth and remember the myth and it pushed them forward. So let me tell you a little bit, just a little bit about the California Indians. These are some of the Native American groups that we had here in Southern California, Central California, Northern California, long before the Spanish came, the Russians came, uh, the French, uh, the British. There were many, many, many language groups, cultural groups, tribes, uh, Native American people all over California. This is a, as accurate a map as I could find. Some, some of the names have been left out, but as you can see, there are many different languages. That changes dramatically 
when the first contact occurs. Some of those languages and those cultures start to, to fall away, but initially there were at least 300 different dialects spoken in, or, in, in California and 100 different um, distinct languages. Let me tell you a little bit about Orange County uh, Indians. We had many Indians here in Orange County, not quite as many as in central Mexico or down uh, uh, in the Inca Empire, but we did have several uh, uh, Indian groups here, and they lived in small huts. They, they were semi-nomadic people. They really uh, did not have the, um, I want to say they have a complex cultural political system. Their, their civilization was not as advanced or their structures and their, their uh, architectural works were not as big as other places, but they definitely had a culture. They had a language, they had a religion, they had a history. They, they, had, um, they had a unique value in a unique place. These, this is an example of some of the structures that were here in Orange County. This one happens to be in Los Angeles County. But, but you'll see when we start looking at maps like this, today we divide ourselves up into cities, and cities are clustered like this. Well, a long time ago when there's no freeway, there's no highway, there's no road, you know, a, a, a group of Indians really can stretch out over a vast area of land because there, there's no way to connect or disconnect people. So these structures, although they may not be accurate for all the Indians in Southern California, are very typical because of the climate, the plants, the, kind of the resources we had to build. This is a, a illustration of some of the Indians that may have lived around San Juan Capistrano area. A and as the Spaniards came, and we'll talk about it in a few seconds, they began to change the names of the Indians. They began to change the language a little bit and the culture. So that is uh, the original name of the Indians around San Juan Capistrano area. I'm not very good at pronouncing it, but I think it's Aje, Aje Cheme. It's a very old pre-contact pre uh, language, pre-Columbian language. And that language sto slowly started going away as the Spaniards came northward, established the miss mission system, and taught the, the locals uh, to be uh, ca Catholic, Spanish-speaking Christians. Let's talk about the Spanish era. And then we're going to talk about the truth and some of the myths. Some of these you might recognize, some of these you don't. The Spanish era is about 1492 to 1821. The Spanish already had an empire, a small empire in Europe and, and, and Africa, um, and they were growing. And there was a race for competition, as you probably remember from, from uh, your elementary school days and junior high school days. And they were trying to get to the riches back east, way east, into to the, to the uh, Middle East and to, to Asia. So someone came up with the idea, I'm not quite sure if it was Columbus or someone told it to him, we can go west and go around the world and come out in, in, in Asia. It's gonna work, you know, trust me. No one trusted them for years, so he finally gets a commission and, and they go. Well, what he discovers by accident is a whole new world. And in doing so, he starts to lend credence to a lot of the myth and the legend of the new world, and, and he starts to create and add some of his own. So eventually, Columbus gives way to many other explorers. One of them is Cortez. Cortez, around 1519 and 1521, he hears rumors, and he hears stories, and he hears that there are cities of gold, and there were cities that had gold, and some of them had a lot, some of them had almost nothing. But a couple of stories in particular really captivate him and some of the other explorers, and one of them is, is this so-called lost city of gold, El Dorado, the gilded one. So when they hear these fascinating stories, and they actually conquer a culture like the Aztecs, and they find a ton of gold, it just kind of feeds the fire, and, and now you got some truth, and now you got some legend and mythology, and now they have this story where somewhere in the Americas there was a, a, an empire where every time they, they changed kings and they crowned a new king, uh, they would create this, this beautiful barge and push him out to the middle of this lake and, and adorn him in gold and jewels and precious stones, and part of a, of, of a weeks-long ceremony was to put on the wealth of, of the people and then bathe in this river and throw the riches in the river. We don't quite know if that was true or not. We never found it, but we did find the Aztec Empire. So that leads Pizarro in 1532 to 1535 to look for a, an Aztec Empire or the, the, the city of El Dorado. And, and he doesn't find it, but he does find the Incas and conquers another civilization and finds more riches and more gold and more silver. So that fuels even a bigger fire, a bigger story. So there's another story that comes out around this time. It's called the Seven Cities of Cibola. And this is another legend. We're not quite sure where Cibola was, but they believe it's somewhere in the Sonoran Desert, 
northern Mexico, Arizona area, somewhere around there. And there were supposed to have been these cities of gold, a whole like collection of cities where, where they had riches beyond the Incan Empire, beyond the Aztecs. So now you're getting the Spaniards excited about exploring because they are excited because they found uh, cultures and, and, and they conquered some and they did, they had actual riches to bring home. But now you got these dazzling stories about what could be out there and, and it just gets better. Well, one of those stories has to do with California. You may have heard of this story, maybe not. There's a, an ancient story, um, part of its mythology, probably not true, but there's a story about a, a lady named Queen Khalifa. And this is a fascinating story. If you've not heard of this, I encourage you to make note of that author, uh, or I'll let you uh, copy my notes later and get that book. It's available, it's been translated to many languages. Um, it is just a fascinating story about a mythical Amazon woman, a black warrior princess who lived somewhere here. So now we're exploring the new world as Spaniards. We found some lands and we conquered them. And then we're also making up stories, but then the Native Americans are telling us, oh no, no, there's this place way out here in California. That, that coast is called California. It's named after her, Khalifa, and she's a queen. And if you just find the island, everything else will pale in comparison. So now you've got all these um, brave men who are leaving their families in, back in Spain and Europe, in the Caribbean, now in, in Mexico City and coming northward, and they're on um, exploration ships al for a long time, no women, and they're hearing these awesome stories about beautiful Amazon strong women on islands that, that have no men, and they're only allowed to have <laughs> men once a year uh, for a ceremony where they procreate, let's just put it that way. So mythology, truth, desperation leads to more exploration. So we'll get back to her a little later, but I just want you to see this slide. This is how vast the Spanish Empire was. It includes Europe over here, part of Latin America, Central America, South America, right? And all of this. Much of this had not been explored yet because most of the riches were here, here, and down here. So our problem is Californians. This is what leads to our isolation and our, our, our unique sense of self is we're so far north, when ships traveled north, they couldn't get past all the winds, so it was very difficult to travel, and no one really wanted to make the journey. So they would, they would send overland missions, and those were even worse, because you had to walk through a desert to get up to California, thinking Queen Khalifa's gonna be there, it's gonna be awesome, there's gonna be all these Amazon women, <laughs> massive civilizations, and you get here, and they give you um, uh, those little pine, uh, acorns, and maybe some, some, some uh, vegetables they got or some fish, and you, you appreciate it, fresh water, a place to stay, but no, no vast civilization, no gold, no advanced math or science or, or architecture, and no Queen Khalifa. So what do we do? So what do we do? As Spaniards, we gotta figure out, all right, what do we do now? We got this new world, we have to go northward. Well, this story is a very powerful story. According to the legend, on this island, they developed a culture with Amazon women who rode these beasts and warriors, these, these, these uh, griffin animals who would consume the flesh of men, and, and these women would take these, men in, these, these birds into battle with them. And at one point, she's convinced to join um, uh, an expedition to go back to the Holy Land and fight for the Muslims to kick out the Christians. So something happens along the way, she converts to Christianity, she marries a Christian, and she comes back home to California. So the legend persisted, and this author in 1510, right around the time of the exploration, right around the time of the Aztecs, right around the time of the Inca, and, and right around the time they're going into northern, um, uh, northern Mexico, southern California, this book comes out. So all these sailors are giving each other a copy of this book, and they're really getting into this book. Well. The Spanish have conquered a vast empire, and now it's time, time to go north into California. Among some of the first explorers were these listed here. You, you, uh, oh boy, I gotta say his name right because I'm gonna get it right. You, Uyoya, uh, is one of the first to believe to have left Acapulco and go to about southern Gulf of, of uh, I think it's called the Sea of Cortez, right around the, uh, the tip of Baja, California. And he's the first guy to really come back and say, hey guys, look, I read the book, you know, I'm with you, okay, there's an Amazon woman, oh, I never found her. 
but it didn't matter because the legend was already there, some truth was already there. So we send another guy, we send uh, Juan Rodrigo, uh, Rodriguez Cabrillo, and he discovers San Diego Bay. So now, okay, we're finding a safe harbor, we're finding some land, but we really need a huge harbor because on the return ship, on the return trip from the Philippines, Spanish galleons are running out of food, they're running out of water, the men are not healthy, they, they're running out of fruit, they're getting scurvy. It's a long ride from the Philippines to California and then down to, to Mexico. So they need a safe place to harbor. And San Diego's not quite north enough. So they send out another expedition. Uh, Vizcaino, he goes out there. His job is to find a harbor. And believe it or not, during this whole time, from this time to this time, they keep driving right past San Francisco Bay, San Francisco Harbor, because of the fog and the rain. And, and, and if you've ever been to, to, I'm not from San Francisco, but I've been there several times. You could be scheduled to fly out that day and you're not going anywhere because the fog is so thick. If you know um, uh, what I'm talking about, they just did, they couldn't see it. So they went right past it. So Vizcaino's getting nervous. He's got to report back. I got to find something. So he says, oh, Monterey Bay. Oh, Monterey. You can park the boats there. You can dock. It's going to be great. So that leads other people to go up north, but they never quite find a beautiful harbor. In fact, they miss it for a couple hundred years. Eventually, we get to Gaspar de Portola. Around 1769, he leads an expedition and they start coming northward by land. This is one of the early missions, Mission San Juan Capistrano. And the goal was to, to claim what, the, what was ours as Spaniards, bring up people to settle it because we're starting to get nervous now because others are coming from the north and they're starting to come down like the Russians. And now we're getting competition from some of our European uh, rivals and they're starting to come west overland and they're starting to encroach on our massive Spanish empire. Well, I've already mentioned before, no one wants to go north. It's, it's too rough. So somebody's got to do it. So eventually they start the California mission system. And it really starts in Baja, California. Baja, California, I think it had a total of 30 missions. And it really starts in Baja, California, continues northward until where we are. And here's an old map. Uh, it, it's uh, a replica uh, of El Camino Real. I don't have the date. I thought I had a date on there, but I can't remember what the date on it is. But it's an old map that was made uh, when people were starting to drive here in Southern California a little bit more. I think it's 1930 somewhere. I can't quite see it. So it outlines sort of the path that the, the Spanish took. They had already started down here in Baja. And now they're working their way up north, establishing missions, looking for places to have a presidio, places to build a pueblo, a city. And they're coming up through here. They marked Fullerton, but Placentia would be right around here. They should have marked our, our city. <laughs> but now they're coming up northward. And here's where another kind of legend starts, another myth. So as they come northward, they get to the Santa Ana River. And they've never experienced an earthquake. So. They're traveling overland and they experience a, a massive earthquake and it really scares them. So they give the river several names. Rio de Temblores, River of the Earthquakes. El Rio del Dulcisimo Nombre de Jesús de los Temblores, which means the sweetest name of Jesus of the earthquakes. <laughs> because they were terrified there had been a series of earthquakes when they camped along the, the banks of the, the, what becomes the San Ana River. So um, the soldiers just referred to it as Santa Ana River because they arrived around the, the day of St. Anne's. Uh, so they, the, the name sticks. So eventually, I'm going to give you a detail of some of the missions. They build missions from Baja all the way up to San Francisco. But as they move forward, uh, things start to change a little. The names of some of the Indians start to change and they start to give them a name um, connected to a mission. So as they move northward, these are called Luiseño Indians because they're by San Luis Rey. Diegueño because they're by San Diego. Uh, Juaneño, San Juan Capistrano, and so on and so on up the, uh, the coast. Gabrieleño because they're near uh, the mission San Gabriel. So this is where it kind of depends on your personal take. I encourage you to do your own research. Some people really have a uh, a bitter taste for the mission system, and I understand why there's definitely research there supports it was not a good thing. But there's also some research that shows that it wasn't completely bad. In some ways, they did preserve the culture, the, the history. They helped preserve 
because the, the, the priests would take uh, good notes and they, they would write things down and they were trying to teach these guys how to become Christianized and civilized. So in a way, it was a negative thing, but in a way it was a positive thing too because we have a lot of their notes. I want to remind you how many language groups we had and we simplified them and just said, you are now Luiseño, Gabrieleño, and so on and so on up, up the, the coast. But the locals, they didn't forget their language. They didn't forget their culture. They just did what they were told when they were supposed to go to mass. And they kept some of their culture, some of their religion, and especially their language. Uh, typical mission life. This is just a quick summary. The goal was to, to uh, release the Indians eventually, but basically they wanted to convert the Indians to Catholicism. Teach them a craft or a trade. Uh, teach them Spanish. Have them help us build a structure and then have them create a local economy and eventually after about 10 years release them into what we hoped as Spaniards was a thriving economy. Well, very few people came north. <laughs> so even if we were to release the Indians and they did eventually, um, there's nobody there. There's, there's no economy. Most of the trade was done without money. It's, it's a very bizarre idea for us as, as, uh, as Americans. They really had a different understanding of capitalism. A lot of it was a handshake and a smile and your word and, and, and who you were and being trustworthy and trading goods. We didn't trade money the way they did in, down south in Mexico or definitely in the United States. So now let's get to the Spanish ranchos. Here's where I have to introduce another myth and then reality. From about 1769 to 1821, we had what was called the Spanish period. But there's a lot of mythology associated with this. Most people, I wouldn't say most, many people believe all land grants were Spanish. It's not true. Very few land grants were Spanish. In fact, uh, really there was, there was only about 20 or so land grants and they weren't land grants. Most of them were land use permits in California by the Spanish government. You really didn't get the land deeded to you. You got permission to use the land. But because there was no one out here, excuse me, no one's gonna enforce the law, who is going to come up here and say that, you know, that's not your land, you can't claim your land? It kind of by default was, but technically it was not. However, uh, many people believe that they're all Spanish land grants. Well, the truth is most of them were Mexican land grants, and they were, ha they were awarded after Mexico became independent. Two of the biggest uh, land grants that affect us, or, or, or land use permits, were Rancho Los Nietos, which was huge really one of the first land grants ever or land use permits ever granted, 1784. It was from the San Gabriel River essentially to the Santa Ana River. And later it gets subdivided and creates many little ranchos, but it was a huge tract of land. But it didn't belong to them. Eventually though, Rancho Santiago de Santa Ana is granted and it's granted as a Spanish land grant and it's one of the, the biggest land grants here in Orange County. Just to show you how many ranchos there were and how big they were, these are some of the names. I'm sorry I couldn't get a cleaner copy, but these are some of the ranchos in LA and Orange County. Orange County be down here. And they were massive from Baja, California, all the way up to north of San Francisco. They were massive and very few people were here. This brings me to a, something called a diseño. This is very important, but very controversial too. When the Spaniards measured land, it was very different from the way the English measured land. The English were very precise. Latitude, longitude, you had to have a, a I think it's called a, an elevation marker, and from that point out, everything was measured. And then the, that marker could be traced back to another marker, another marker. So you can pretty much find things in precise location. It, in the Spanish culture, and definitely in, in, in California, it was very uh, loose, very kind of like, okay, so my property's right here by the Santa Ana River, and it kind of goes out to the beach. These are the, the, the beaches right here, Long Beach, Seal Beach, okay, Newport, okay, Corona. And it kind of goes up to the mountains or so, and kind of out here to uh, one of the other ranchos, let's say Los Alamedios. So they really didn't have the grid system that we had. And it worked for centuries because there were so few people out here and most people were married, uh, intermarried, so they knew each other. There really wasn't that much conflict. However, as the Americans moved westward, and they began to buy land in, in, in territory that was Spanish and Mexican, they began to uh, buy and sell, and they wanted proof that you own the land. So the Spanish people would say, well, I got proof. You know, I got this granted to me by the, you know, the Mexican government. Here we go, it's my diseño. So to us as Spaniards, totally made sense. To us as Mexicans, totally made sense. To the Americans, it was, it was subject, uh, 
for discussion. And a lot of them unfortunately lost their land with war with Mexico concluded and they were trying to prove the land was theirs and they'd go to court. They'd say, well, okay, I see your decennial. Let's go out and measure. And some of the measurements were by the river where it bends and those uh, five or six oak trees are, there's a little gully. That's the start of my land. That's the southernmost point. Well, times change, you know, or geography changes over time. So they go out there to look for these land markers. They're not there. So uh, an antiquated system for a more idyllic time, but when things became modern, it was difficult for them to prove what was theirs. This is a better map to show you some of the ranches that are Orange County, parts of LA County, and uh, a little bit of San Diego County. We are here. Santiago de Santa Ana is here. Canyon, uh, I can't even see, Rancho Canyon de Santa Ana is up here, and Los Nietos was over here, but I just wanted you to see, one family essentially owned all of that. One family owned all of that. It was massive. It was massive and very thinly populated. So where does that take us to now? Rancho life. This is a very, uh, romanticize. It has a lot of mythology, but there's also some truth to it. Life in the ranchos was very different than it was in, in central Mexico and southern Mexico. It, you could call it a little more laid back. It was similar to a plantation life. Similar to it in this. The Spaniards were the leaders. When the Spaniards were replaced by the Mexicans, the Mexicans were the leaders. The upper crust of society held land, held title, and they, they managed their properties while others worked for them. And the Indians did most of the work while learning a trade and a skill. But, but, but really, the, the people at the top didn't do very much. However, they did work. Many of them were retired soldiers, or what they called soldados de cuera, uh, and, and they were retired military soldiers who'd served 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and at their retirement, they make a request for land and usually toward the latter end of their life, but still they asked for land and in most cases they were given land. So as a favor for their service to, to the government and as a way to encourage them to start a family and, and populate the area, they were given these vast tracts of land, but it was very different here. Because we're um, such an arid uh, geography, it wasn't like it was in other parts of the United States. So farming was very limited, but they did farm. Um, the diet was beef, beans, and tortillas, but there were other foods. Uh, the local Indians showed them some foods, and we brought uh, vegetables and seed uh, stock from central Mexico and all the way from Europe, and we started growing things here, a and it really flourished, although we don't get a lot of rain. If you can get to a river and get some water, the soil here is really good. So one of the, probably the most important thing was cattle raising and sheep and horses because you just let them loose out in, in, in the hills, and they... They do the rest, and, and you know, every, twice a year you go out and bring them back, and, and you've got a lot more than you had the year before. And since we really didn't have money, we paid a lot of our bills with sheep, with cattle, and with horses. So this is a very, very important part of, of, of what becomes California culture. This is probably one of the most important parts. Next to the, the church and, and the religion, it, the adobe or the hacienda basically becomes the center of the community. Everything is based on that. And because we were so isolated, if a party would occur, it would occur at one of the bigger haciendas. If someone got married, it'd be at the bigger haciendas. If someone had a baby, it'd be at the hacienda. If there was a funeral, it'd be at the hacienda, or what we call the rancho. So they really become the focal point of the com community, much like the, uh, the plantations did in the South. So they had music there, they had dances, they had life there. So a lot of this is true, but a lot of it is very romanticized too. Um, these are some Spanish dons and some Spanish doñas, and they did dress that way if they were wealthy. But not every day, because it's a very impractical way to live your life here in a very um, dry but hot environment. Most of them were very hard working class people, but the way they worked was so different because it's nothing like um, capitalism, nothing like our, our busy, fastidious, uh, English and, and French backgrounds, it's, it's very different. So they really did have a, a sense of, 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 a, of a gentleman and a gentle lady. So that's where these titles of Don come from and Doña. When I was a little boy um, growing up in Santa Ana many years ago, I never understood why my dad would say, uh, Martin, I want you to go next door and tell Mr. So-and-so that, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I went to uh, Clark Dye Hardware in Santa Ana, bought a garden hose and I want to give him one that were on sale. 
But we couldn't say Mr. We had to say Don Miguel, Doña Maria. And as a kid, I remember growing up in Southern California, like, why are we saying that, Dad? We're, we're in California. As I got older, I realized, oh, it's not only is it, is it a title of no, uh, a term of nobility, but it's really deference and respect for the elderly, the landed people, the wealthy people, and really, it was just a really wonderful way to greet one another as 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 a, as a term of respect and term of endearment. But there's also a lot of mythology that uh, they all pranced around on horses like this every day. Everyone was rich. Everyone was beautiful. They had beautiful gowns. That could have been it if, if this part of, of, of California were better connected to um, Mexico and trade was more uh, common and, and things can get to you sooner. Things didn't get to us very soon. So we made a lot of our own stuff. We built a lot of our own stuff. We ordered stuff months, sometimes years in advance and hoped the shipment came in. So we made do with what we had, although we did dress up fancy like Mr. Andres Sepulveda, one of the, the many people here in Southern California. Um, they did dress that way, but not everyone. This guy in particular was uh, very famous for some of the bets he would make. And this is truth and mythology as well, because some of the bets are, can't be confirmed. But I did find one. Uh, Mr. Sepulveda, Don Sepulveda, bet Governor Pio Pico that he had the fastest horse in the region. And since there's no pay-per-view, there's no, um, there's no um, uh, Netflix, there's no YouTube, that was our entertainment. So they made a big deal about it, and the whole town comes out to see this race between uh, uh, Don Sepulveda and his black swan against um, Pio Pico's best horse called Sar Sarco. So in 1852, it, it seemed like the whole of Southern California came out to watch this race that was a, a, about a, a nine mile race or so. And everyone kind of lined the little roads and was all excited about it. Once the race started, you didn't see anything. But you saw it when it ended, and part of the problem was because the mustard seed would just grow so wild, and it was you know, about 10 feet tall along the sides of the road, unless you were right by where the horses ran, you really didn't see much. But it was a big deal to us as, 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 as Spaniards and as Mexicans, because there wasn't that much entertainment out here. So people got dressed, and people came out to see you know, the event, and they would bet, and he bet um, approximately $25,000 in 1,500 livestock that his horse would win. Black Swan won that race, but he did lose a lot of other races. And a lot of times they would gamble quite a bit. And since they had so much land, they had so many animals, it was okay. It just, I'll give you a thousand cattle, go ahead. Or I'll give you a big chunk of my land, I've got more. So it, it really didn't matter until the Americans started to arrive and we started making bets with them. And they didn't want um, cattle, they didn't want um, uh, the uh, tallow and, the, and, the, and the, the, the leather, they wanted the land. And, and little by little, some of these guys were, that liked to bet started their, their, their land acquisition would shrink and shrink and shrink until they got bought out. So let's go to the Mexican era. There's a little bit of mythology here too. The Mexican era is a time period when most of the land grants were issued, not the Spanish era. So around 1822 to 46, the reason I picked uh, 22 is, is that's right around the time Mexico becomes independent, becomes its own country, it becomes a republic around 24. 46 is when we start the war with, with, with the United States. Within two years, everything changed. So between those uh, two uh, different markers, about 800 or more land grants were issued. But it's also a time when, when Spanish culture, Mexican culture, the Hacienda culture, the California culture really comes to the fore. And it really becomes an important part of the community. So prominent citizens and uh, officials who wanted land, as I mentioned before, they would submit a diseño, a diagram of, of your land. And then they'd have to have some kind of alcalde or a mayor, domo, go out and measure it and confirm. And they'd go out and measure and look for the inaccurate measurements and they'd agree together, well, it's inaccurate, but it's yours. And then you'd have to plant some kind of uh, fruit trees or some kind of plants to improve the soil and improve the land. And they did. And then you'd have to build a residence. And here's where a lot of the Spanish, now Mexicans, really got wealthy. It didn't say live in the residence, it just said build a residence, have a residence. It didn't say how long you had to stay there. So many of these had multiple residences, multiple adobes, so that they can claim the land. And they'd improve the land and have some kind of orchard or, or they'd raise cattle there. And one of the last things was called the act of possession. And this is kind of unusual to us, but it's, it's very common to them. You would have to go to the land in front of a, a government official and you'd have to pull out some herbs, or some roots from the ground, and you'd have to scatter them in the wind. 
and you'd have to pick up some soil or some stones and, and scatter them in the wind and, and acknowledge and say that I take possession of this land called, and you name your rancho. And then the other official would say, yes, I see you, uh, you have you know, improved the land, you built a hacienda, you scattered some, some, uh, some uh, roots or some weeds and you, you tossed some stones. Uh, it is now official, it is your land, you may take possession of it. So they would take possession of it, but they wouldn't live there. So now the tracts of land that were already big become bigger and bigger and bigger. And because there were so few men here and so few women, they all start to intermarry. And this is where it gets really complicated. So they're all related. That's the best way I can put it. Uh, Bandini, Yorba, Peralta, uh, just about name them all. They're, they're all related somehow because um, as the soldiers got older, many of them would marry very young women or young girls. And in some cases, um, childbirth was very difficult. It is very difficult, but now we have modern medicines and modern hospital facilities to help us. Well, childbearing uh, and child rearing was very difficult. So a lot of these young girls, um, young ladies, could die. And um, some of these men married and remarried and remarried and had children after children after children. So they had to marry those kids off eventually to someone else. So it became very, very complicated. So eventually, these are some of the ranchos here in Orange County. And chances are you were related to someone because you might live way out in Trabuco, but you know the family Los Coyotes because your cousin lives there. And you want to get married and someone down there wants to get married and they arrange the marriage. And they did that as a way to really bring community together, but it was also a way to protect property, property rights, water rights, which were extremely important because there's so little water here. So uh, a lot of these ranchos were family members or family members by, by birth or by marriage. So it became very complicated. I tried to bring a diagram of genealogy of some of these families. Wow, I started taking some notes, you guys. Just not that it matters, but just so you can see. I started here, I went there, I went backward. It, it, it's very complicated, but just know this. It was a t tightly knit, tightly woven community. Um, this is the one that pertains to us. Rancho Cañón de Santa Ana, also Rancho San Juan Cajon de Santa Ana, and the one I mentioned to you earlier, uh, Rancho Santiago de Santa Ana. The problem is they all sound the same. And in some of the documents, they use the same name for two or three different ranchos. And many of them refer to the Santa Ana River or another saint or another geographical feature. And it gets a little confusing. So rather than sticking to all of those names, we'll pick two or three of these. Time permitting, we'll talk about some of them. So here's the, another look at that map again, just to show you uh, how vast this place was. Very few natural predators for the cattle and the sheep, and they just let them roam. And they just produce, and the soil would produce too. So after a while, American clipper ships would go up and down the coast. And they needed the tide, uh, the hide and the tallow, and we needed fabrics, we needed ax axes, tools, we needed soap, we needed all kinds of stuff. So they traded with us what we needed as Americans, and, and in the North as Russians, and we traded what we had locally, which was a ton of it. And that was always an excuse to also have a party. So as they would come in and do business and trade, we would come down because there's nothing to do, and we'd make a big deal, we'd have fandangos, and we'd have dances, and we'd have big parties, and we'd have big celebrations, all for commerce. Now let me mention to you a couple other things, and I think I mentioned this to you before, but I, I don't know if I remember. They gained independence in 21, they create a Mexican Republic in 24, and then when the Mexican government comes in, they start thinking a little differently than the Spaniards. They are still into um, Christianizing the locals. They still want to spread Catholicism, but they're a little more into finance. They're a little more into, not exactly capitalism, but they want to make money. One of the first things they did, and this is both a good thing and a bad thing, is they secularized the missions in 1834. And what that does is, in addition to all these ranchos, you also had missions that had huge tracts of land because the mission was supposed to serve as, as the local hub for the Indians and for the Spaniards. Well, now that the land has been secularized, it's no longer under the control of the Catholic Church. Yard sale 
and we start selling stuff big time because now we can petition as Spaniards, we can petition as Mexicans, we can say, hey, look, I want some of that mission land. And the mission can argue back and say, well, no, technically I'm using that land and we need it for the Indians. And then this, the Mexican government reminds us, we release the Indians. Oh, well, so then a lot of the, the mission land starts to shrink and the ranchos get even bigger. Oh, I think I did mention this. Now, because we're Mexican, and we're not part of the Spanish Empire, we can do trade and business with pretty much whoever we want. Before, when we were part of the Spanish Empire, we could only do trade and business with friends of the Spanish Empire. Now we can do business to uh, whoever comes um, knocking on our front door. So Californios are um, a group of Spanish descendants, now Mexican descendants, that really they're very romanticized, but a lot of what they did was, re was real. It's a very genteel life. Some of them had Castilian ancestry, but some of them were also mestizo. And mestizo is a fancy way of saying some of them were purebred Spaniards born in the New World. Some of them were purebred Spaniards that came all the way from the Old World across the ocean, across Mexico, north into California, and, and they married other pure blood Spanish. But because there's so few people here, after a while, you're going to intermarry with some Indians and you're going to marry with some Spaniards and you're going to get mixed blood. And there were a few um, blacks or Africans. They came up to found some of the pueblos. So some of the um, Californios weren't quite Castilian. They weren't all quite genteel. They weren't all of noble blood. I know a lot of people believe that and, and I'm not saying it's not true. Absent a DNA test, we really don't know if your great-grandmother was an Indian or not because there was no photography. We really don't know if your great-grandfather was a pure-blood Spanish or not because all we have is their name on a, on a piece of paper that the Catholic Church gave us when they baptized them. So the other thing they like to do is, is, is work the field with their, with their cows and their horses. So they become America's first vaqueros. You could also argue that it was someone else too, but they really become America's first cowboys. And they really introduce a lot of the cowboy culture that, um, that rugged individual, the hardworking man and woman, they introduced that not only to Spanish culture, Mexican culture, but because America is slowly encroaching on, on Mexican land, it becomes part of Texas culture. And there, that's where we start getting more cowboys. Well, before Texas was American, it was Mexican, and before it was Mexican, it was Spanish. So a lot of that vaquero cowboy mentality really is fostered all over the Southwest, West, but in particular in, in, um, in California. This is another overly romanticized um, photograph, but they're real. So they did dress like this. They just didn't always dress like this and not, it, not everyone could afford it. And sometimes um, it just cost too much money and you couldn't get what you needed shipped to you fast enough. So the lady on the right is Josefa Bandini de Carrillo, wife of Pedro C. Carrillo. She was a daughter of Juan Lorenzo Br Bruno Bandini. So very well-connected families, very uh, intermarried families. And, but uh, on their own, because of their separation from Baja California, because of the separation from Central Mexico, and really from any other country, they, they start to think of themselves not as a country per se, but as their own unique people. Like we are not so much Spanish or Mexican, we are Californios, that's who we really are. And there's still some, I don't know if any of you are in the room now, but to this day there are people who can retrace their heritage back, not only to the first families of California and Orange County, but in particular they take pride and say we are Californios, we are part of that culture, we're part of that, the last, um, the last West. <coughs> this is one of the early California families in San Diego in the 1840s. Um, I don't know if it's Maron, uh, a very famous uh, California family in, in San Diego, in front of their adobe. These are the three um, ranchos I'd like to talk about, but I know I've only got about nine minutes left. So, but there were 15 ranchos, I narrowed it down to three. So I'll show you as many photographs as I can, but I wanna uh, um, remind you, th this is a, the, the tough part about being a historian, there's truth, there's myth, there's, there's legend, there's reality, there's, there's memory, memory fades, okay? And doing the research, some people say 1834 in some sources, some people say no, 1830, 
three. No, 1835. Well, it was actually 27,000 acres. No, it was actually 30,000 acres. Actually, it was 26. So it's very difficult to get precise numbers. But, but in general, the Orange County ranchos really did follow the pattern of the ranchos from Baja California up to San Diego, into Orange County, up to LA and San Francisco in terms of how they lived their daily lives. Religion was very important to them. Family was very important to them. Taking care of their hacienda, the rancho was very important to them. Work was not so important because others did the work for them. So I'll try to get through as many of these as I can. Oh, my time's up. Oh. Well, I really want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Okay. Rancho Santiago de Sena, 1810. This is one of the diseños for it. Highly accurate. If you get lost, just take out that map and you're good. It's a very, it's a very old map. We can barely see some of the color and some of the letterings. The, these are, uh, I believe this is the Santa Ana River going out to the ocean. These are some of the mountains. I could be wrong, but it's very hard to read. But it's, it's one of the original diseños or the map uh, of the local region. And this is what you use to prove ownership. Got to take my notes out. Okay. This one's going to get confusing. Some of you are related in this room. You already told me. All right. I'll do my best. Okay. Two important families. Jose Antonio Yorba and Juan Pablo Peralta get the rancho in 1810. But it wasn't really, um, they weren't the ones who asked for it first. Initially, it was asked for by Juan Pablo Grijalva. He asked for the land initially. So the relationship between these two guys is Peralta, I gotta look at my notes, is the nephew. Yorba is the uncle. And I think I got that right. Okay, did I get it right? And they petitioned for the land because Juan Pablo Grijalva had petitioned for it before and was denied. I'm not sure why he was denied land. He still used land in, in Baja California, near San Diego, and eventually here in Orange County, but he wasn't given the land or, or wasn't given the uh, permit to use the land. Eventually, these two are successful and they get the land. And it is a huge tract of land. A little bit about Jose Antonio Yorba, he was a retired soldier. He traveled through California with the Gaspar de Portola expedition. He was one of the original Catalonian volunteers who volunteered to leave Mexico and come up and say, yeah, I'll go with you. I want to go see what's out there. Juan Pablo uh, Peralta was the grandson of, of, whoa, I got the names wrong. That should, that's incorrect. That should say grandson of Juan Pablo Grijalva. And he built an elaborate adobe. And I don't want to forget this about adobes. They had multiple adobes. It depended on where you were at the time of the year and the season because you couldn't get around as easily as you can now. So depending on where you were, what you were harvesting, what you were doing, you had different um, size structures for different types of tasks at different times of the year. However, they really did like to have one big central place for celebrating. And these two were no different. This is an example, it's an illustration, because there was no photography, but it's an illustration I found out of some of the dress that they possibly wore coming north. By the time we get photography here, by the time we get accurate uh, photographs of the, 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 the uniforms, they've changed a little over time. And since they're handmade, they're not being quite made exactly the same way as they were in the past. This is an old structure that was found on the Rancho uh, Santiago land. And it's, it's a 1936 photo of the ruins of Juan Pablo and his son Rafael Peralta's adobe. And it was once a beautiful, beautiful estate, but like many of them, because the Spanish and the Mexicans had been here so long, as time went by and the children married off and you didn't have the help of, of the forced help or help of the Indians to maintain the property, it just started to fall apart. And as we came westward as Americans, we saw no value in them. It was just land to purchase, a structure to tear down, I'm gonna build a, you know, a farm there and, and, and put some oranges there or whatever. Um, so a lot of them, are gone. In fact, most of them are gone. And now that we're older as, a, as, a, as an American culture, as Californians, as, as Mexicans and Spaniards, we wish, we wish we had them. Um, how many of you know about the packing house we used to have downtown that's going to be a train station, right? We wish, right? We, we got one left. So 
This is just an example of some of the structures that were on, on the property and what they may have worn when they came here. This is um, the five adobe pueblos of the entire Rancho Santiago um, de Santa Ana. There were many, but I found in my research there was a Peralta property, there was a Santa Ana Abajo property or adobe, there was a Santa Ana Viejas, Santa Ana Arriba, and Las Paderes, and they were scattered throughout the, the, the rancho. So let me go back real quick and you, you would build them in different places. So some were built up here. Some were built, uh, this would be El Medina. This would be Santa Ana. I think this is orange, but I can't quite see it. So depend, they, were, they were scattered in different parts of this entire estate, all the way down to the coast. And at the time, since there were so few of us here, the families would, would, would marry and the kids would move out, but they wouldn't move out. I guess it's like today, they're not moving out. <laughs> But there was some distance, you know, there was some distance. Today the kids are like right there and, you know, changing our, our Netflix when we want to watch something else. But back then, they moved out, but not away. You just gave them a piece of your land and they built their own structure and then they got married and they filled that home and they said, dad or grandpa at this point, grandma, we need to subdivide this little corner again and they just kept kind of subdividing the different regions. Let me go forward and catch up because I don't want to keep you guys late. Bernardo Yorba. Okay, this is an interesting story. I know some of you are related to Bernardo in here, so help me out. Okay, let me see if I get it right. I apologize in advance if I get him wrong. Okay, very interesting man. He was um, son of the original um, Yorba. He was a third son of many of the kids they had. Um, but he, he had several wives, and he was a prolific, uh, let's say, father. So he married his first wife when she was about 16, Maria Jesus Alvarado. And within about five years or so, they had four kids. She passes away. He marries his second wife, about the same age, 15, 16, Felipa Dominguez, who died while giving birth to 12 children. The 12th child, I think, uh, was when she passed away. I don't know if they had another child. She passes away. He marries his third wife. And... According to the legend, according to mythology, according to the story, according to the truth, perhaps, he didn't even go marry her. The others he actually married. This time he sends a proxy to L.A. to marry her for him, because by this point he's a retired uh, military person, he's worked on the farm, he's you know, put in a lot of work. He doesn't even want to go up and get married. He sends someone to marry for him and they bring her back. He's married to her for uh, a while and she was about 29 years younger than he was and she bore him four sons, eventually he passes away and leaves the vast estate to her and their kids. 20 or so in total. Some of you are related to them. Here's a Bernardo Yorba adobe. Um, it doesn't look like much because by the time we got to it as Americans, it's 1900. We're talking, you know, years here. The structure's fallen apart, but it once was a beautiful place. It once had the best parties. It's claimed to have had about 100 rooms. People would come. Uh, I don't know how it is at your house, but my kids are teenagers. They'd come and visit on Friday, and they leave Sunday. And I'm already like, okay, you know. People would come and stay a spell because he had so much space, and he wanted to entertain, and he wanted to be lavish. He wanted to show that he was part of the genteel class uh, um, of the Californios. He let him stay. So his, his estate was huge, his house was huge, but it eventually, like a lot of these old structures, they start to fall apart. Here's another photograph of it. And, and we're very fortunate in that as Americans came west in the 1880s or so, 1860s or so, 1870s, they were bringing photography with them. And a, a few of them took a fascination into these old structures and these old stories, and they captured them and saved them for us. Otherwise, we wouldn't even have this photograph. Here's another picture of it. Notice the cars in the front. I mean, just, just to show you how long they've had it. This is all that remains today. On the left, you have a beautiful picture of a stone monument dedicated to the Yorba family and to the Yorba property. And it's on the corner of Esperanza Road 
I think it's called Echo Hill. I don't know if I got it right. But if you're heading down Esperanza, it's right around where it looks like Esperanza is about to end and it starts to curve a little. And there's a beautiful neighborhood up there and right inside the road <laughs> by some flowers is this sign. And that's what it looked like in the 60s. This is what it looks like today. And, and I didn't know it was there until I started doing my research last four or five years to, to help the, the historical committee. But I fly by there all the time. Never saw it. But l just look at how much it's changed from the 60s now. Right? A, a full development, full community. Some of you may even live there or have friends that live there. Have you got time for one more? All right. Okay. This is a Placentia family. This is Ontiveros. If you were here for our first presentation way back in September, it's the one we started with in September when we originally started our series. So this is the Ontiveros family. And you're looking at a picture of Juan Pacifico. And he marries Maria Martina. And they married at the San Gabriel Mission, of course, because they're good Catholics. And they want to um, raise a family and they need some land. Those are the children he had. And notice how they intermarried. I highlighted two names for you. Yorba Lane. And by now, a good German name, right? Is that German, Langenberger, am I, am I right? So now we've got some good Germans coming from the East Coast. <clears throat> some of them are coming way east. They're trying to escape some of the, the fighting that's taking place in Europe. Coming to the, to the, to the East Coast, and they don't like it in the East Coast, and they come out west because there's more opportunities. So this is Rancho San Juan Cajon de Santa Ana, because it's by the Santa Ana River. And it was issued May 13, 1837, by the governor of California. Um, and it was issued to Ontiveros and Mar uh, Maria. And it was about 35,000 acres. It, not exactly, but sort of takes place um, in Anaheim, Florida, and Placentia, and other parts of Bre Brea. And there's other places. And a lot of these, um, it's difficult to find maps that, um, that do what I want them to do unless I create them. You have to find the old map, or the, the old diseño, Spanish, the old Mexican diseño and then the American map, and then a modern Google map. So you can see exactly how, but basically, other cities kind of took some of our placential land, but it initially belonged to them. This is what was left of their adobe in 1936. They were not here as long as, as the Ontiveros, or excuse me, as the Yorbas though. They um, raised a family here, and very quickly, uh, Juan Pacifico began to subdivide um, his property among his family, and he began to sell to other people, and eventually he leaves us and moves up to Santa Maria, where he and his wife and some of his family members that he took with them from here and connected with some family members up in Santa Maria, they really helped establish the Santa Maria Valley uh, in the Santa Maria uh, area, and there's a lot of connections to our Ontiveros family up there, but very little here. I don't know if you know this, but there's actually a monument here in Placentia on the new road on uh, Crowther leading to the Sam's Club, there's a, it's in need of repair. So if you're going to, a shout out to, I think it's April 30th. It's uh, Everybody Loves a Placentia Day where you're going to go out and volunteer. They're going to be rebuilding the little, the little structure we have there. But there's a little monument to the Ontiveros, and that's all we got, guys. There's a, the, the structure in the, in the 30s. I just read all that. And here's a newer diseño. I won't show you all of it, but... Here we are, right? Crowther's back here. Sam's Club would be around here. And he sells a tract of land to a bunch of Germans that came out from San Francisco, from the East Coast, not quite sure what they're going to do. They want to start a winery. We're not, gonna sure, we're not sure if it's going to make it. We're not sure if Anaheim Colony is going to make it. But we'll sell them a tract of land. Well, you know Anaheim explodes, and eventually um, we start going to, uh, we as Placentians start going to, to Anaheim. But look at how big this track of land was, and it wasn't the only one he owned, but look what he had, Santa Ana River. So um, in our other presentation we did in September, uh, we, we talked a lot about fighting for water rights, but essentially he leaves us from here, leaves the land to his sons, they subdivide it, and as more Germans are coming here, they start to sell the land, and here's kind of a mythology and kind of a good thing, bad thing. Sometimes when the um, Americans came, they married for love and for land and for money and for religion. Some of them converted, some of them did. There are many cases though where it is clear there was no love, there was no real genuine conversion, they only wanted the land. And, 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 and this history here in, in Orange County and in other parts really is kind of a mixed blessing. Some of them intermarried and had wonderful marriages. Some of them they just took the land. It, it's, it's really what happened. Well this gets all subdivided and they're gone and then placentia starts and we'll end with this. 
Here's the Ontiveros Adobe in 74, before they uh, got rid of it. Um, we'll skip all that. This is the guy we need to know, and you probably already know. Sells to Daniel Kramer. There's Mr. Kramer. He comes here in 42. In 65, he's in Southern California. I think the first or one of the first English-speaking people in this area. And these are more placentians, and I'll stop there just to show you that, that his land gets subdivided, and their land gets subdivided, and so on and so on. So you've got McFadden, Tuffrey, Gilman, Strang, uh, Wagner, Bradford, um, Crowther, uh, Nano, Key, Birkenstock, Chapman, and so on and so on and so on, and there's more. Eventually, here's what happens to our little adobe. It's going to be sad. We're going to end on a low note. That's us saying goodbye and demolition day. But someone saved a couple of bricks. And you can check out the bricks here in the library. There's two of them left. Um, I, don't, I, don't know, I wasn't around then, uh, but someone saved it. And, and now we wish we had it. We wish we had We got two bricks and some nails. There's the structure that's uh, the monument. But it's, it's in need of repair right now. So if you want to help us out, April 30th, right? And we're done. So I went over. Does anyone have any questions before he... <laughs> no, I'll stick around. Oh, we got one. Um, the myth about the city of gold, is that something that could have been perpetuated by the natives? Because Both. Because the explorer came and they said, oh, no, you don't keep going, it's even better. Absolutely. That way. It's, it's both myth because you wanted to get rid of them. Because after a while, the, the Spanish figured out what they needed from the Indians and, and what we could get from them. And the Indians figured out what they could get from us, the Spaniards. So some of it was true. There were trade routes from California way down into Mexico. And there are, there's archaeological evidence that there was trade. Uh, there's uh, um, stones, precious metals that, that, that traveled and descriptions of, of Southern California culture and Mexican culture. So that's part's true. But the other part is true, too. We just want to get rid of them. Oh, there's this great city. Oh, there's seven cities over there. They're made of gold. And oh, it's amazing. There's Amazon women. Oh, you have a book even better. Go that way. So we just kind of kept pushing them. 